tried to talk science and technology in our regular tech talk with technologists and futurists. Matthew Dickerson, who joins us again now at ABC. Hello, how are you going? Good, thank you, Nick. I haven't talked to you for a few weeks. Good to see you back in the chair. Yeah, how are you going? Have I, have I caught you overseas? I'm actually, these days in the world? I'm actually sitting on the edge of the Nile River in Cairo at the moment, so doing it very tough, Nick. Oh, for God's sake, what's got you there? <laughs> oh, nothing more than interest in pyramids and Egyptology and the Nile River and just having fun. <laughs> Why not? Look, this is the home of technology and engineering, really. It's the sort of birthplace of, you know, the Library of Alexandria, so... You know, why not? You are spot on, right. and some of, some of the technology they had three and a half thousand years ago was quite fascinating. But yes, we digress. Oh, yeah, yeah, you know, chemical technology and preservation and embalming. Don't get me started, man. <laughs> uh, anyway, let's, let's go from the cradle of civilization to the cutting edge. Uh, I noticed that uh, there's been a new world record set by a bipedal robot. Why is this significant? Well, I think it's significant, and it's not that impressive when you look at the time. I mean, I remember you was a pretty handy runner, Nick, and I reckon you could do 100 metres. No, 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 high, high jump was always mine. Uh, right. <laughs> was, was always my, mine. <laughs> well, I'd still back you in against Cassie, the bipedal robot. The Guinness World Record that's just been set by Cassie was 100 metres in 24.73 seconds, which is okay, but not blistering in its pace. But really the breakthrough here is all about bipedal. And that's where a lot of organisations, universities, researchers are really trying to work on a robot that can walk around on two legs because that's what we do. And so we've designed our world to work around two legs to get around from place to place. So if we're going to have robots come and help us in our community, help us in what we do on a day-to-day basis, then having a two-legged robot is going to be better than, say, a four-legged robot. We've seen things like Boston Dynamics. uh, They've got Spot the Robot. We've seen even uh, Oregon State University has got their robot called Digit. So there's a few four-legged robots around. They're faster. They can do some things, but they're never going to be quite as good as a two-legged robot. So having a robot that can now do... What what is the advantage of the two legs? I mean, certainly four-legged robots can go really quickly, let alone robots on wheels. You know, they can just power away. Why is a two-legged robot like a human... What's, why is that such an advantage? I think the real advantage there, Nick, is that we've designed our world around two legs, around humans. We've designed steps around okay, humans. Right. We've designed what we do around the world with two legs because that's what we've got. So if we can get a two-legged robot to do lots of things as well as we can, then that will give us a huge advantage. Four-legged robots, sometimes the space just doesn't fit a four-legged robot because it's obviously longer than it is taller and there are some spaces that that doesn't really work for. So two legs, if we can get that right, that'll make it much easier in that standing position. And we know we've got robots that are going to help us around the home at some stage soon and do things for us. And again, that space, that that sort of shape of a two-legged robot will help in that situation. Mm. All right, let's go from that to uh, the vexed question of dongles. We've all got several of them. Uh, lightning charges for apples. Uh, I've got uh, mini USBs for powering up my, uh, my external batteries for four phones. And I've got a slightly bigger USB for my uh, Zoom recorder, which I use for interviews. Uh, are we heading towards a universal charger? We are heading that way in Europe to start with, but that will go across the rest of the world. And you're right, you've talked about a couple of different USBs, micro used to, USB used to be the thing, but it used to be worse than that, Nick. It used to be at the stage where each device you bought had its own proprietary charger. And I remember about oh, fif- no, no. 15 years ago it was that I actually had to throw away a good video camera because I lost the charger for it and the charger that I had was specific to that one model of camera, and I could not find another charger to fit that camera. So the camera was useless to me without any way to charge the battery. But the European Union has been very concerned about waste, about e-waste. 
and every time that you bought a new product, whether it be a phone or whether it be a gaming console, maybe a tablet, for example, then it had a different charge in some circumstances, or even if it had some similarities, you were always getting another charge with each of those devices. And they looked at the incredible amount of waste that was created by all of these charges, because many people had some of those charges already, and then they looked at all these charges that were building up. You open the bottom drawer of your desk, you had all these different charges. You didn't know what they came with, which one suited what. And then you got to the point where you went, well, I just, I'll just i put another one in the bottom drawer or I'll throw them all out and there's lots of waste created. So they've said in 2024, so not that far away, all phones, all gaming consoles, all of those small devices, excluding computers at this stage, but all those small devices must use USB-C. And that's been getting to the stage where it's a fairly common sort of charger up to this point. The only one that's bucking that trend has been Apple. Apple have stuck with their lightning port on their phones, although on their iPad Pro and iPad Air range, they've gone to USB-C, but on their standard iPad and on their phones, they're stuck with oh, lightning. They really? Yeah, so... so there's a different, different charger on different iPads. Yeah, just to confuse the whole oh, world. Yeah. And, and it's been interesting, Nick, because Apple has said, well, we don't agree with this decision. We don't like this because it's been brewing for some time. We don't like this decision because, in, and this is an Apple quote here, in inverted commas, it will stifle innovation, which I find interesting because they're happy to do it on their iPad Air and their iPad Pro, but they still think it stifles innovation. What that translates well, to is... The Pro, which is the really, yeah, the really expensive one. That's right. And what that translates in my terms is it means we can't make as much money out of charging for other devices that use the lightning cable. Because anyone that makes a device using lightning has to pay a small license fee to Apple, of course. So here's the big question, Nick. In 2024, every iPhone sold in Europe will have to have USB-C. What will they do for the rest of the world? Will they make two different iPhones? So if you're in Australia or if you're in America, you buy an iPhone and it's got a lightning port. If you're in Europe, you buy an iPhone and it's got a USB-C port. I don't think they'll do that. I think they'll go to the stage where it's just easier from a manufacturing perspective to make them all the same or... Oh, surely they'll all go USB-C. You think so. Or the big outlier may be they may say, well, we got rid of the port to plug headphones in a few years ago. Why don't we just get rid of the charging port altogether and just use wireless for charging and wireless for transfer of data? (laughs) Is there any technological advance? advantage to USB-C compared to Lightning, or they're basically the same thing? No, USB-C is quite good in terms of its transfer speeds, and they're continually developing new versions of USB-C, so you can get higher transfer speeds with USB-C. Charging-wise, if you're just using it for charging, no, much of a muchness, but the transfer speeds at this stage are better with USB-C. But apart from that, it's really that commonality. What we want out of our charging port is to be able to charge the device, obviously, and to transfer data. And USB-C does that. it doesn't matter which way you plug it in, Matt. That's the important thing, isn't it? (laughs) I hate that about the old ones. The the little USB, with my bad eyes, I can hardly see which way up it bloody well goes. (laughs) So thank goodness for USB-C. It doesn't matter. And normally there's only two ways for it to go, but normally it takes you three attempts. The first attempt doesn't quite go. You flip it over, it doesn't go again, you flip it back, and it was the first way you tried. (laughs) (laughs) Matt, uh, all the best. Thank you very much for joining us from Cairo. We'll chat to you from home next time. Sounds good, Nick. Thank you. All right. See you later. Matt Dickerson, our technologist and futurist, uh, talking to us, believe it or not, from the banks of the Nile. ABC Illawarra.